Hi everyone, my name is Valerie and today I would like to talk to you about the book I recently read called Prophecy, Key to the Future. It was written by Dwayne S. Crowther. Um, the topic is on the second coming of Jesus Christ and how end time events may unfold as revealed by modern day prophets, apostles, and scholars of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, I really love this book because it showed that the second coming might be much longer than we thought it was going to be in terms of process. Um, and I really loved how it explained trigger explanations. So why do certain things start happening? What initiates them? I like how it made end time connections and brought a little bit of color to the whole story of the second coming. So I thought, well, since I enjoy it so much, I'm just gonna make a video. Um, so I'm not compensated by Dwayne Crowther or affiliated with him in any way. Um, as I made this little book summary, I stayed true to his book with a few exceptions. I added one context slide at the beginning. I reordered some chapters. He put the Battle of Gog, Abomination of Desolation, and Armageddon in one war. Um, but I kind of think they're three, so I parsed them out as three, but you can come to your own conclusion about how those unfold. Um, there are a couple chapters that sort of repeated some information, so I left them out. And then at the very end, he has additional chapters about the, millennia, the millennium and the end of the world. But I just kind of ran out of steam at that point, so you'll just have to read the book if you um, are really interested in those chapters. I was mainly interested in, you know, what's, what's going to happen at the second, second coming? So in terms of his sources and the, the prophets that he quotes, there's just too many to quote here or to list here. So you'll just have to read the book. All right, so here's my one context slide. So for those people who aren't familiar with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, here's a brief, one brief context slide, and that is, as you know, Christ and his apostles were killed about 2,000 years ago. What's been happening ever since? Well, um, since then, um, uh, the church, the Christianity has uh, exploded and fractured, both at the same time, in the U.S. today, we have over 200 Christian denominations, and worldwide, there are over 4,000 different types of Christian denominations. And as you know, um, that is a far cry from what Christ talked about when he was alive, having one Lord, one faith, one baptism, where there was a unity of belief, a unity of faith, where everyone believed exactly true things. It, the, the way was narrow. It was not the broad path that led to destruction. Um, so he was teaching true doctrine. But today, there's so many different types of Christian faiths, all teaching different things, um, that there's a problem for him and his children and God's children, right? How, how are we supposed to um, have eternal life based on teachings that may not be true? Um, do, are we really expected to, to get there by, by, by chance, if you will? So the way that, the, that God helped solve that problem is in 1830 he restored the church of jesus christ um, on the earth today with modern day prophets and apostles with with modern day revelation and the coming forth of more scripture namely the book of mormon which is another testament of jesus christ um, written by the tribe of joseph on the american continent so while the bible was being written on the asian continent this one was being written on the american continent so that's the context, and those are the prophets and apostles that we're quoting. So um, there you go. All right, let's uh, move on. So in this chapter, the author talks about how the Lord has commanded that the restored gospel of Jesus Christ be preached to every nation. And he talks about how this will be done in mostly four sequential periods of proselyting. So right now we're in the first period, which is um, the times of the Gentiles, where we're teaching the gospel to the Gentile nations. Gentile nations are defined as those who embrace some form of Christianity. So if you've read the Bible, you know that the times of the Gentiles began with Peter's vision and the baptism of Cornelius. Prior to that point, um, Christ and his apostles had been teaching exclusively to the Jews. At this point, now the gospel went from the Jews ex exclusively to also the Gentiles or non-Christians. And that growth, that time of the Gentiles, continued with the restoration of the church in 1830. And it will end when the focus of missionary work switches to the house of Israel. 
So why would that missionary work switch to the house of Israel? Well, the Gentiles, having had a full opportunity to embrace Christ in his church, will reject modern day prophets and apostles because of the precepts of men. Um, our missionaries will be withdrawn from um, teaching the Gentiles. We will no longer seek them out and the roles will reverse. In other words, we will no longer go to them. If they find us, um, then they can come to us, but we will no longer go specifically out to them. And that will mark a huge turning point in this book. Um, it, it will be the start of wars and judgments in the Gentile nations, including the US. Um, so there is a, a phrase, fulfillment of the times of the Gentiles, that, that marks that turning point. And what I liked about it is it showed that it, this could be potentially the first domino that triggers all the others of the second coming. <clears throat> uh, so we'll just watch out for that. Now, when that time comes, um, it's either going to be the 20, turning point where the prophet comes out and says, okay, the times of the Gentiles are over. Saints, gather to Zion cities. Or um, it could be an act of God that, that gets us to, to gather to these Zion cities. I don't know which one it's going to be, but it's likely one of those two. Um, and I will say one more thing about the times of the Gentiles. It really does look like um, it's about to be over. For the past, I don't know, since about 1990, this glo the growth of the church and just the growth of Christianity in general has started to wane. So today's generations are not embracing Christianity as much anymore. They're becoming increasingly secular. And so ooh, we're getting really close in my personal opinion. Okay, so at that point, the missionary work will transition to the house of Israel. So the gospel message will go to three different types of Jewish people. The Jews in Israel, who mostly won't embrace Christianity until after Christ comes. Um, the Lamanites that you read about in the Book of Mormon, who... Um, who are the ancestors today of the, the, those who live in North, Central, and South America. And eventually the 10 tribes, the lost 10 tribes, will come down from the North into America and they will need to have our scriptures and we get to have their scriptures. So that's gonna be really fun. So those are the three people that will get the bulk of the, um, the missionary work. Okay, then the missionary work will move on to heathen nations, those who have not embraced Christianity. And the gospel per this uh, book won't be preached to them until after Armageddon. They're going to see the rise of old Jerusalem. And, and that at that point, that will be very convincing to them um, that, wow, you know, this, this uh, Christian God has, has something going for it. And then the final mission to mankind just before and during the millennium. All right, so the book also, also talks about how God pours out his judgments. The prophets and apostles definitely talk about this um, a lot too. So there are many natural disasters throughout the end times. You can expect them to increase in number and in intensity. Uh, there are three main types of pestilences. We read particularly in the Doctrine and Covenants and in the book of Revelation about a scourge and desolating sickness. And it sounds really gross because your flesh is going to fall off. The eyes will, you know, be like acid and burn out of their sockets and fall out of the sockets. And your tongue is going to, you know, uh, liquefy in your mouth. It just, it just sounds terrible. So it will come rapidly and will cause many people to die. In the book, in the um, Doctrine and Covenants, we read how the report thereof shall vex all people. So the numbers will be so high that it will just be horrifying. And just will sicken your heart about how many people are going to die from this. And it will continue to be poured out until, quote, the earth is empty. So how many millions of people are going to die? How many billions of people are going to die? Uh, it's going to be awful. Um, we're also told that famine can, is going to happen by at least four methods. Hail storms, changing seasons will interrupt crop cycles and cause them to fail. Lack of water and water pollution. And natural disasters that, you know, we see around the earth today. Earthquakes, floods, tsunamis, storms, etc. And America will not be immune. Many of our cities will be left desolate because of the pestilences and are destroyed and the famine or destroyed. And the prophets have prophesied that New York City, Albany, and New York will be destroyed, not just met left desolate, but destroyed due to these judgments. All right. They also talk about 
the prophets talk about how the U.S. government eventually will collapse and that mob rule will take over the nation. So why do they think this is going to happen? Per Wilford Woodruff, it's likely because of these things that are happening on this slide. The pestilences, the famine, the natural disasters. And with um, all these critical workers dead, you know, if all the people who die who produce products, and with, and with all the supply chains disrupted and all the, you know, the because of earthquakes, etc., the roads will be destroyed. Um, supply chains and supplies in general will be gone or, or, or very scarce. And so with nobody having access to food unless you raid your neighbor, guess what? People are going to start raiding their neighbor and it will be city against city and state against state and, and individual within against individual. So the strife and opposition within these communities will cut down the government, mobocracy will prevail. And at this point, we must be gathered into Zion cities. Um, and those Zion cities will be established worldwide. They will first be populated with us, the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But as peace seekers around the world, those people who don't want to fight and kill their neighbor, um, they don't want any part of war, they just want peace they will soon start flocking to us for protection. Um, so prepare to be fully self-sufficient, number one, for yourselves. So if there's no supply chain anymore, you need to know how to do um, home manufacturing. I mean, how are you gonna supply your own needs for food, for shelter, for all of those things? Um, you may have to flee your home, and if so, how are you going to live? So. Today's the day to get those preparations ready, prioritize food, water, and shelter. And because we will have so many people who will come to us, um, I would not prepare just for your family. Expect to prepare beyond your family because the, the need is going to be so great. Now, we're not going to be the only ones who, whose government is going to collapse. This is going to happen worldwide as the same thing happens to them. You know, people will die, supply chains will be disrupted, and they will start the same type of mobocracy. The wicked will kill the wicked. And um, Joseph Smith was seen in a vision what this looks like. And he says that it gets downright just ugly. Um, even family members will be against family members. They'll kill each other for food, water, supplies. And just because, you know, there's just so much anger in the world. So if you don't want to kill war with your neighbor, you must flee to a Zion city because we will be the only people not at war. Uh, the Book of Mormon also talks about a conditional curse in America. It says that if we don't repent of our wickedness, that a remnant of Jacob will tread us down. Um, so that remnant of Jacob is likely um, the people who live today in North Central and South America. So. Uh, note to everybody who lives in America, you know, if we do not want to see the fulfillment of this, we need to repent. All right, the book also talks about the rise of the political kingdom of God. So all political kingdoms of the earth, including that of the United States, will eventually be destroyed by this mobocracy and will need to be replaced with something. What is that something to uh, provide rule and order on the earth? It's the kingdom of God, a theocratic government headed by Jesus Christ, and as spoken of by Daniel, it will fill the whole earth. Now, the kingdom of God is not to be confused with the church of God. The church of God is a religious institution. It's the church that we go to, you know, every week, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's a religious institution. The kingdom of God is a government. So Zion's priesthood elders in these Zion cities will assist in bringing forth the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. It will be founded on the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution was brought forth by God for the freedom of all people on the earth. And so that is the template that we will go to in establishing um, law and order uh, in the world. So these Zion cities will grow in part because of the protections of the government. So maybe people will not be attracted to the religion, the, the church of God, but they will be attracted to their peace-loving people, their noble, peace-loving people, and they will be attracted to the kingdom of God for safety. Now, um, when Joseph Smith was on the earth, some of the parts of the kingdom of God were, were revealed, but not all of it, so um, that's going to be something that our modern-day prophets will have to reveal. 
Now, can you hold an office in the kingdom of God on earth, but not be a member of our church? Yep. The kingdom of God serves to protect all men in their rights, regardless of their religious creeds. As kingdoms of earth fail, the kingdom of God will rise and will never be thrown down. It will be an everlasting kingdom. Now, yes, there are going to be Zion cities throughout the world. There's going to be one headquarters, though, um, in America, and that is Zion, New Jerusalem, headquartered in Independence, Missouri. Um, a leader like Moses will be chosen to take and organize the saints in that headquarters. Some people believe that it will be Joseph Smith as a resurrected being. Um, whoever it eventually ends up being, you can expect the travel to Independence, Missouri to be difficult. By then, earthquakes will have dis dis disrupted roads. Um, supply chains will have been disrupted, so there's no guarantee that we're going to have gas. And even if we did have gas, you know, there's no guarantee you can you can get through the cracks in the earth, etc. So it's going to be a difficult journey. Get good shoes in your, um, you know, your 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 kids. Um, we're promised a cloud will cover Zion travelers by day and a pillar of fire by night. Um, Zion cities will feature those elements too, the, the cloud by day, the, the pillar of fire by night. The presence of God will be there and will strike terror into the enemies of, of Zion. These cities will glow. They will feel fear our Zion cities because they don't understand the quote-unquote technology that we have, which is actually, you know, the presence of God. And because they don't understand it, they will not attack us in them. Christ will appear in the temples built there personally, like he'll be there in person. Zion cities will operate under the law of consecration, the united order, and the celestial kingdom. So if you do not want to live those laws, you cannot have inheritance within the walls of Zion. Now, maybe you can survive on the outskirts of Zion without living those laws, but not within Zion because you have to be living according to those orders. In the U.S., um, Zion headquarters in Independence, Missouri will be built by who? Primarily by North and South American saints, the Lost Ten Tribes, and the New Saints. Isn't that interesting? So yes, if you're an American, you will, will, you will build it as well. But um, the Book of Mormon talks about the, the, a huge role that um, these other groups have in helping to build Zion. The book also mentions something, some important events happening in America. The Lamanites need to be gathered in. And of course, that's happening already, um, but that work will intensify following the fulfillment of the times of the Gentiles. The Jews also need to be gathered in, including the ten, the lost ten tribes of Israel. Speaking of the lost ten tribes, they will come from the north down into America. A great earthquake will precede their coming, and some of the, uh, um, the, the authors in the book think that this could be the great earthquake that ends the sixth seal, in the book of Revelation. So desolate, desolate American cities, so those that have been wiped out by the plagues, um, etc., will be inhabited by those who are gathered in, including the last 10 tribes. Eventually, Zion will grow so big that it will inhabit both North and South America, if, if it will fill those continents. A group of 144,000 high priests, yes, this is the 144,000 in the book of Revelation, they will be chosen among these 12 tribes of Israel once all the tribes are together. And these high priests will be transfigured. So why are they going to be sealed on their forehead as you read? Well, that means they're going to be transfigured and their bodies will be changed um, and strengthened somehow so they can preach the gospel or gather Israel without experiencing bodily harm. They will need to have strength and superhuman abilities to endure, you know, earthquakes, whirlwinds, whatever comes their way. The Lord, we're told that the Lord will visit his saints in the New Jerusalem. I'd read before that they, that he will come to our temples, but I hadn't read that, that he will even come into our homes. So that was really cool. Can you imagine Christ coming to your house? The city will glow, as I mentioned before, because of the presence of God's glory and the light will be visible for miles around. Everyone will be able to see it. Um, the book also talks about the gathering of Jews to Israel. I put in a couple of um, new facts and figures just so to provide additional context. So the Jews gathering to Israel has been happening for many years. Large-scale immigration of the Jews to Palestine began in 1882. And it was followed by several other things, um, which now, as of 2018, which is the latest st statistic I could find, shows that Israel contains... 
45% of the world's Jewish population. Wow. I mean, that's amazing. That's the Lord just showing forth his arm and making things happen. Eventually, a temple will be built in Jerusalem, and a large group, if not the majority of Jews, will not accept the gospel of Christ until he manifests himself unto them on the Mount of Olives. Now, um, with the 144,000 sealed against the plagues that are to come, and the times of the Gentiles over, the seventh seal opens, which is hugely important, because um, this is when destruction on an incredible scale starts. So uh, we read in the Bible, in the eighth book of Revelation, that we're going to start to hear voices and trumpets and plagues begin. Orson Pratt believes that we will hear audible voices worldwide speaking out of um, the thunder, speaking out of the lightning, speaking out of the tempests and the tsunamis. And those voices will be telling the world to repent. Um, he, Orson Pratt, also believes that we will hear the seven trumpets sounding. Now, in, in the book of Revelation, it doesn't say whether or not we will hear them sounding, but he believes that we will hear them sound. And those uh, seven trumpets sound the following devastations. Um, trumps one through four, in trumps one through four, a third of the earth is going to be impacted. Air, water, sea life, ships, green grass, trees. Um, that's the first four trumpets. And then the fifth trumpet talks about the arrival of a foreign army of 200 million men. Sixth trumpet is the slaughter of the third of the hosts of men by the foreign army. And the seventh trumpet is the sanctifying of the earth and the seven vials of wrath. All right, after the New Jerusalem is built, while the Jews are still gathering to Israel, Israel, there's going to be this period of universal conflict and war. The only places on the earth that will be free from war will be in Zion cities. Interestingly, that conflict, per the book, will also serve to fast track the gathering of the Jews to Israel. So, you know, if this conflict is in their home countries and they need to go somewhere else, well, naturally they're going to want to go and join the other Jewish people in Israel. Um, as we've seen, the conflict will destroy Gentile nations. Um, the heathen nations, or non-Christian nations, they will, of course, will also be affected by the war, but um, they will retain their national identities. They'll lose power and dominion, but unlike us, they will retain their national identities for a time. Um, now, he speaks about how these wars will result in the death of one-third of mankind, and I felt that that might conflict with the 200-man army that also kills one-third of mankind. So I don't know how he recon reconciles those two things. So it's just an open question. Um, however people are killed, the survivors will be left in disorganized conditions in lands filled with rubble, devastation, and chaos. All right, a bit of good news. So during the period of universal conflict, an important council will be held in Missouri at Adam on Diamond, as you know. And the council will be under the direction of the Ancient of Days, which we know as Adam. And all priesthood, or excuse me, all prophets who've held priesthood keys of authority upon the earth will come to that council and will give a report of their work to Adam. A huge number of people will be there, some mortal. But what's interesting is um, some of these prophets and apostles say that the largest body of people will be there will mostly be immortal. They will come back in their um, immortal bodies and, um, you know, present the keys. In that meeting, Adam is going to organize the entire human family, and each priesthood quorum will be assigned its place in the church of God. Now, ooh, I wish I knew more of the details about what he's going to organize. Um, you know, is he going to tell us where to live? You know, is he, like, you know, how is he going to do that? Is he going to get, give us church assignments such as, you know, Valerie, you will be a uh, Relief Society teacher. I mean, <laughs> You know, how do, they, how do these things, like, how detailed is this going to be? I don't know, but it's interesting. Um, also, rule will be turned over to the saints, and we will get to judge the affairs within the church and also the fate of some earthly nations. So the priesthood brethren, I'm assuming, will be asked, what should we do with Spain, and what should we do with France? <laughs> and anyhow, that should be interesting. In that meeting, Jesus Christ will appear, um, Adam, after he's received all those reports and the priesthood keys, he'll make his report to Christ and return the priesthood keys to him because Jesus Christ is going to reign personally over the earth 
in the millennium as Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Um, he's going to reign over the Church of God and the Kingdom of God. All right. Okay, so during this universal conflict, people will be flocking to two places, New Jerusalem, which is um, Zion in Independence, Missouri, and also people will be flocking to Old Jerusalem. So let's talk a little bit about each of those. So New Jerusalem in Independence, Missouri, or Zion, will experience a great increase in population, importance, and esteem. So the nations of the world are going to watch us grow um, as their nations are destroyed. They will recognize our expansion, our progress, our peace, our lawfulness, and stability. We will be a standard to the nations. Old, meanwhile, in Old Jerusalem, in Israel, um, it will gain a new leader, a righteous man named David. He'll be raised out of the lineage of David the king. He will build the temple in Jerusalem and lead the nation. He will hold both political and religious power. He will remain the leader of Old Jerusalem. He will take, he will take Israel through the end times and into the millennium. Following the sealing of the 144,000 high priests and the destruction of a third of the hosts of men, those lost tribes at some point will move to Israel. Now, when they come to America, they're going to establish America and they're going to be there for several years. This is not going to be, you know, they're not going to be settled into America and a year later move to Israel. They're going to stay in America for a while. They will build up North and South America. But then eventually sometime it will be appropriate for them to move to Israel because they've got some work to do in Israel. They're going to inhabit the empty homes there. They're going to assist Prince David in rebuilding the city of Jerusalem and building the temple um, before the visit of Christ at the Mount of Olives and the Armageddon War. So Israel's borders will explode. They will greatly expand because of these 10 tribes moving to Israel. Israel, Israel will be involved in several wars or political disputes in the region. And you can see that naturally happening, right? As they come to take, um, um, to inhabit the empty housing there, um, I'm sure you can see that there will be some political strife, some religious strife, and envy issues at a minimum. Um, but regardless of those people who want to fight them, they will conquer their enemies. The temple will restore sacrificial worship. So what you read um, in the Old Testament of how they slaughtered the lambs, all of that, that's what we brought back. The law of Moses will not be restored. It's just the, the sacrificial worship will be restored because that's an eternal principle of the sacrifice, rather. All right, now here's where the author and I um, didn't quite, uh, I shouldn't say agree, but he kind of threw all these things into one war and he could be right, but there are just some details that make it seem like it's not, it's not right. And even he, even he himself didn't feel comfortable throwing them in one war and neither do I, but I also don't feel comfortable throwing, putting them in three separate wars. It's just a gray area. Who knows how this is gonna go down? Um, but the, the details just are not striking enough to help us to really have a handle on this. But nevertheless, I know that there's going to be at least three-ish battles. There's going to be the Battle of Gog. Um, so following the return of the Jews and the Lost Ten Tribes, Israel will rise in wealth and power. And the surrounding nations will be like, wow, okay, these are cities without a wall. Um, look at all the wealth they're bringing. Um, let's attack Israel for a spot, spoil and a prey. So they'll attack Israel. Christ will ask the invaders to repent with rain, hailstorms, fire, and brimstone. The attacking nations will lose the battle and be destroyed. In the book of Revelation, we learn that only one-sixth, or wait, it's Ezekiel. I figure out. One of the scriptures tells us that only a sixth of the soldiers will remain alive to bury their home, to, re to return. Okay, let me rephrase that. Only one-sixth of the soldiers will remain alive to return home to their countries. It will take Israel seven years to burn and destroy all the weapons and seven months to bury the dead. And at that point, the supper of the great God is fulfilled when beasts and fowls eat the flesh and drink the blood of the fallen ones. Another battle that we hear about is this point of abomination of desolation where the beast and false prophet attack Israel. They tread Jerusalem underfoot for three and a half years and desecrate the temple. The 
pro the two humble, powerful witnesses or prophets keep the army at bay for three and a half years. They're killed. They're resurrected. As they ascend to heaven, Christ appears on Mount Olivet. An earthquake fells 10% of the city. It kills 7,000 people. It cleaves the mountain twain. The reigning soldiers that fight against Jerusalem are hit with a plague of flies that consume their flesh. The, the Dead Sea is healed. The nations of the earth mourn. The Jews ask, what are the wounds in thy hands and thy feet? They're converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they're sad, and they weep because they persecuted their king. So that is when the moment when a lot of the Jews will be converted is when he appears to them. Um, the seven trump sounds, the time has come for the signification of the earth, completing the salvation of mankind, and woe number three. And that's when God unleashes woe number three, the seven final plagues, which are the seven vials or bowls of wrath. Massive destruction. Then we have Armageddon. So let's see. Let me look at this slide here for a second. Yeah, okay. So look at the third bolt from the bottom. In the, the seven, in one of the, the vials or the one of the bowls of wrath, um, devils are going to work miracles to convince men to gather to Armageddon. And so there has to be some type of a break between this war and Armageddon because, you know, people need to be convinced to come to Armageddon. So then Armageddon happens and they're all in one place. They're sitting ducks. Um, the scriptures talk of them as Christ's spoil. So they're gathered in this one place to battle and with the breath of Christ's lips, you know, the army is slain. Like this is not even hard for him at all. Um, so he puffs his lips, breath of his mouth, and they're dead. And the fowl, fowls are filled with their flesh, and, and the beast and the false prophet are thrown into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Okay, I think this is my, these are my last couple of slides. The book ends with, or at least my presentation ends with Christ coming in glory, and all this stuff you'll find in the book of Revelation. So I'm not going to go through all of it here. Um, one thing I found was interesting in this book, um, is that angels are going to gather the righteous from off the earth. In all the movies that you see about this, you know, the righteous are sort of mysteriously lifted off the earth. Um, uh, but the prophets speak about how angels are going to have a role in this. What will angels will gather the righteous off of the earth. Um, another kind of important note on this slide is when Christ comes and people are lifted off the earth. Christ is collecting his bride or his church. And at that point, the marriage of the lamb is fulfilled. So he's collecting his bride. And you remember the parable of the 10 virgins, right? At some point, the door will be shut and you can't get in. Well, once you're lifted off the earth and brought up into heaven, the door is shut. So if you're left on the earth, you can't get in. It's too late for you. So fulfillment of that one too. Okay, Christ comes in glory. Let me just see. I think all this, yeah, all of this is in the book of Revelation, so I won't I don't necessarily need to go through all of this. Let me see. Um oh, something interesting also when Christ comes. Um, when he comes, every eye will witness his coming. In other words, even the dead will see him. So all people who have ever been alive will get to see this moment. And I thought that was really interesting. The earth, of course, will be cleansed by fire. Both animate and inanimate objects will be destroyed. That cleansing is considered a baptism by fire. So Noah's day, the earth was baptized with water. And here, at, at, at the, at the um, end of the world, it's going to be cleansed by fire, which is their baptism by fire. And then Satan is bound for a thousand years, and the millennium starts. So I think that's the last slide. Yeah. So that's the last slide. I hope you enjoyed it. I think it's a really good book. Um, of course, there are more chapters to this book that talk about the millennium and goes into the earth and how it will be changed and eventually become the celestial kingdom. And it is very interesting. Um, but for my you know, immediate purposes, my goal is to understand what's happening during the second coming and how, what can I do now to be prepared. So that's the focus of this presentation. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks.